Hi gang, this lesson is about arthrology, which is the study of joints. Let's begin with an overview of the lesson. In this lesson, we are going to learn about joints. The lesson will be organized into three main areas. The type of joints, the basics of joint motion, and the joints of the human body. For the type of joints, we will examine joints by their functional classification and their structural classification. Of particular interest to us will be synovial joints. We will take a deeper dive into the components of a synovial joint, as well as the different types of synovial joints. Before discussing the different types of synovial joints, it will be helpful to examine some basics of joint motion, specifically the axis of rotation, planes of movement, to include typical movements in each plane, degrees of freedom, both of a joint as well as of a chain, and distal on proximal and proximal on distal movements. Finally, we will examine the individual joints of the human body. For each joint, you will need to know the location of the axis of rotation, the degrees of freedom associated with that joint, the type of synovial joint, and the available joint motions. It's not enough that you can name the associated joint motions. You must also be able to demonstrate proximal on distal and distal on proximal movements, as well as give examples of each. Now that we have an idea about what we will be discussing, let's get into it. Before getting too far into it, though, let's go over some of the basics. We have a joint when two bony surfaces come in contact with one another. Although the depths may vary, one joint surface will be convex, or bow outwards, shown here in red, while the other joint surface will be concave, or bow inwards, which is shown here in gold. Joint surfaces will have two directions, an anterior-posterior direction and a medial-lateral direction. The same bone does not need to be convex in both directions, but if one bone is convex in a direction, the other bone will be concave in that direction. Now we can look at joints according to their functional and structural classification. Joints can be classified functionally or structurally. Functionally, joints are classified as having no movements, synarthroses, limited movement, amphiarthroses, or freely movable, diarthroses. For structural classification, there are three types of joints fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial joints. Fibrous joints do not have a joint cavity and are bound by connective tissues composed predominantly of collagen fibers. There are two types of fibrous joints. We have sutures and syndesmoses. Sutures are where the bones are essentially fused together. Sutures are found in the skull and pelvis. Syndesmoses are joints that are bound by ligaments and may have fibrous tissue between them, but no joint capsule. The distal tib-fib joint is an example of a syndesmotic joint. Cartilaginous joints also don't have a joint cavity, but cartilage bounds the bones together. There are also two types of cartilaginous joints, synchondroses and symphyses. Synchondroses have hyaline cartilage separating the bones. The joint between the sternum and the first rib is a synchondrosis. Symphyses have a fibrocartilage pad between the joint surfaces. The inner body joint and the spine and the pubic symphysis are examples of symphysis joints. And finally, we will take a deeper look at synovial joints a little bit later in the lesson. Now let's take a look at some examples of each. Sutures are where the bones are essentially fused together. Sutures are found in the skull and pelvis. Syndesmoses are joints that are bound by ligaments and may have fibrous tissue between them, but no joint capsule. The interosseous membrane between the radius and the ulna is a syndesmotic joint. Synchondroses have hyaline cartilage separating the bones. The joint between the sternum and the first rib is a synchondrosis. Symphyses have a fibrocartilage pad between the joint surfaces. The inner body joint in the spine and the pubic symphysis are examples of symphysis joints. Then we have synovial joints, which are what we are primarily interested in for this class. With synovial joints, the bones that are in contact with each other are covered by articular cartilage. 
Synovial joints have a joint cavity, which is covered by a joint capsule. The cavity is filled with synovial fluid, which is secreted by the deep lining of the capsule called the synovial membrane. The bones are connected by ligaments, which can be inside the capsule or intercapsular ligaments, outside the capsule or extracapsular ligaments, or part of the capsule, which are capsular ligaments. These are all parts of every synovial joint. Other structures you may find in the joint include things like fibrocartilage, fat pads, and bursa. Now, before we take a closer look at synovial joints, it would be helpful to think about a few basics of joint motion. The first is the axis of rotation. The axis of rotation is a line around which the joint rotates. Generally, that line is fixed and doesn't rotate with the body. You're already familiar with the axis of rotation. The wheel hub on a bike, the hinges on a door, and the pivot point on a seesaw are all examples of axes of rotation. When a joint, or anything for that matter, rotates about an axis, it also rotates in a plane. That plane is perpendicular to the axis. When things rotate, they rotate in a plane about an axis. Think back to the door again. We can say that the axis, along a line that goes through the hinges, is a vertical axis. The plane of movement is parallel to the floor, or a horizontal plane, that is perpendicular to the vertical axis. The door won't move towards or away from the floor unless there's a crooked axis. The same with any rotation. The plane is always perpendicular to the axis, and the body won't break that plane. The rotation is in that plane. Now let's take a closer look at the planes of movement and the movements that occur in them. There are three cardinal planes. The sagittal plane cuts the body in half into a left side and a right side. Rotations that occur in the sagittal plane are parallel to the midline of the body and won't go towards or away from that midline. The frontal plane, also called the coronal plane, cuts the body into an anterior and posterior half. Rotations that occur in the frontal plane means the body won't move anteriorly or posteriorly. The transverse plane, also called the horizontal plane, cuts the body in half superiorly and inferiorly. Rotations in the transverse plane will twist without raising or lowering the segment. We can see from left to right the movements that occur in the sagittal plane, the frontal plane, and the transverse planes will all occur parallel to those planes. The far right shows an oblique plane that does not occur solely in a cardinal plane. Movements that typically occur in the sagittal plane are flexion and extension. Movements that typically occur in the frontal plane are abduction and adduction. Movements of the spine in the frontal plane are called lateral bending or lateral rotation. Movements that typically occur in the transverse plane are internal and external rotation. Internal rotation is sometimes called medial rotation and external rotation is sometimes called lateral rotation. Movements that occur about an oblique axis typically do not have unique names. So you can see here are movements occurring in all planes in addition to an oblique plane. Now let's match the plane of movement with the axis of rotation. Movements in the sagittal plane, shown here in green, occur about a medial lateral axis. Movements in the frontal plane, shown here in purple, occur about an anterior posterior axis. And movements in the transverse plane occur about a longitudinal axis, which is shown in blue. A word of caution. There is some disagreement about what I'm going to tell you, but this is how I want you to know it. If you rotate the reference segment, you also rotate the plane of the moving segment. An example will be helpful here. Let's say that you perform elbow flexion. We typically think of elbow flexion as occurring in the sagittal plane. 
Now let's rotate the humerus and flex the elbow again. Some will say that this elbow flexion is now occurring in the frontal plane, but I disagree. I think you just rotated the sagittal plane of the elbow. The elbow, for the most part, doesn't recognize this flexion as occurring in a different plane, and I don't think we should either. Okay, now let's take a look at a concept called degrees of freedom. Let's think about degrees of freedom as a movement choice. If you can't move, you don't have a choice. If you can move in two directions, you have one choice. You can either go forward or back. This, of course, excludes the choice of not moving. In this course, we will only concern ourselves with rotational movement. Linear movement itself has three degrees of freedom, one for each of the three spatial dimensions. But we are going to ignore those for now. Unless I note otherwise, we will only consider rotational degrees of freedom of a joint. Since there are three planes of movement, there are up to three degrees of freedom for each joint. Note that I say up to three degrees of freedom. That's the most you can have. But you can have less because of bony configurations and or ligamentous constraints. They can remove degrees of freedom and thus movements in a plane. Joints rarely work in isolation, but work as part of a larger chain. Let's take a look at the degrees of freedom associated with a chain of joints. Remember, we're only talking about rotational degrees of freedom here. The easiest way to look at the degrees of freedom associated with a chain is to use a simple example. Let's take a look at a four-link chain that has three joints that each have one degree of freedom. If it is helpful to you, you can think about this as movement of the shoulder, elbow, and wrist that is constrained to occur in the sagittal plane. The proximal joint has one degree of freedom. The middle joint has one degree of freedom. And the distal joint has one degree of freedom. To determine the degrees of freedom of a chain, you simply add all the degrees of freedom of each individual joint. So in this case, we add 1 plus 1 plus 1, and we get 3 degrees of freedom for the chain. Another important concept is the idea of a distal segment moving on a proximal segment is the same motion, but in the opposite direction, of a proximal segment moving on a distal segment. Again, let's look at a generic example. We will look at more realistic examples later in the lesson. In the first case, we have what is probably very familiar to you. The predominant movement is the distal segment moving on the proximal segment. Notice that the movement of the distal segment is in a counterclockwise direction. Now let's look what happens when the predominant movement is the proximal segment moving on the distal segment. In this case, the movement of the proximal segment is in the clockwise direction. Note that the orientation of the two segments is the same in both cases. For this generic joint, let's say the joint motion in both cases is flexion. In reality, joint motion oftentimes has both segments moving, but we can always think about it as the motion occurring predominantly by one segment. Armed with these basic concepts of joint motion, let's take a closer look at the different types of synovial joints. There are six types of synovial joints, gliding or planar, hinge, pivot, condyloid or ellipsoid, saddle, and ball and socket or spheroid. Gliding or planar joints have zero degrees of freedom. Examples include the intercarpal joints of the hand and the intertarsal joints of the foot. A hinge joint has one degree of freedom. The axis is perpendicular to the long axis of the bone. An example includes the elbow joint. A pivot joint also has one degree of freedom. It is different from the hinge joint in that the axis is parallel to the long axis of the bone. The proximal radial ulnar joint is a pivot joint. A condyloid joint, also known as an ellipsoid, has two degrees of freedom. The wrist joint is an example of a condyloid joint. A saddle joint also has two degrees of freedom. But unlike the condyloid joint, the surface is convex in one direction and concave in the other. This is kind of hard to explain without seeing a picture, so if you don't quite get it right now, wait until you see the pictures in a few moments. The first carpometacarpal joint 
is an example of a saddle joint. A ball and socket or spheroid joint has three degrees of freedom and it can rotate in all three planes. Actually, ball and socket joints rotate about a point and not an axis, so not only can they rotate in all three cardinal planes, but they can also rotate in an oblique plane in between them. An example of a ball and socket joint is the hip joint. Now let's take a look at some pictures to help clarify the different types of snowmobile joints. Gliding, or planar joints, have zero degrees of freedom. Examples include the intercarpal joints of the hand and the intertarsal joints of the foot. A hinge joint has one degree of freedom. The axis is perpendicular to the long axis of the bone. An example includes the elbow joint. A pivot joint also has one degree of freedom. It is different from a hinge joint in that the axis is parallel to the long axis of the bone. The proximal radial ulnar joint is a pivot joint. A condyloid joint, also known as an ellipsoid joint, has two degrees of freedom. The wrist joint is an example of a condyloid joint. Notice on the condyloid joint that the same bone is convex medial to lateral and anterior to posterior. A saddle joint also has two degrees of freedom. But unlike the condyloid joint, the surface is convex in one direction and concave in the other. The depicted saddle is concave front to back, the purple line, and convex from side to side, which is the green line. The first carpometacarpal joint is an example of a saddle joint. A ball and socket or spheroid joint has three degrees of freedom and can rotate in all three planes. Actually, ball and socket joints rotate about a point and not an axis. So not only can they rotate in all three cardinal planes, but they can also rotate in any oblique plane in between. An example of a ball and socket joint is the hip joint. Just a quick note about more terminology. You will hear the term joint complex quite often. A joint complex is two or more joints that function as a unit. We will see many examples of joint complexes in the human body. All right, let's review what we've learned so far. In this lesson, you learned about joints. The lesson was organized into three main areas, the type of joints, the basics of joint motion, and the joints of the human body. For the type of joints, we looked at both their functional and structural classification. Of particular interest to us was synovial joints, where we took a deeper dive and we looked at the different types of synovial joints. We also discussed the basics of joint motion, such as the axis of rotation, planes of movement, and we associate typical movements in each plane with that plane, degrees of freedom for both an individual joint as well as for a chain, and distal on proximal and proximal on distal motion. In the next set of videos, we will look at the joints of the human body. We will look at their location for the axis of rotation, the degrees of freedom associated with each joint, the type of joint, as well as the joint motions. Remember, you are going to have to demonstrate distal on proximal and proximal on distal motion and give examples of these joint motions that occur in typical activities. Now it's time to turn our attention to the joints of the human body, which will be covered in a different set of videos.